Okay, so before we get started, I have a little bit of a confession to make. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, so I can claim native Texan. I live in Austin, Texas, and I have a serious love affair with San Antonio, Texas. But I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana, where as we speak right now, it's Mardi Gras. So any other fellow Cajuns in the audience? Anybody who really cares that it's Mardi Gras? Come on, y'all. Les le bon temps roulé. Come on. <laughs> So um, I like to think of innovation and entrepreneurs as like the spice and the sizzle and the energy behind smart connected communities and cities of the future. And it's my absolute honor to welcome this panel because these are the folks who make it happen. So immediately to my left is Paul Reiser, who's the director of Detroit Urban Solutions. Next is Joyce Dooley, who's a program manager for in the pre-accelerator at Geekdom and Civ Tech SA, who needs no introduction. And of course, our very own Krista Covey, who's the Vice President of Velocity, Texas. So my job is to ask the easy questions. Spoiler alert, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, what is an innovation hub? What are your unique perspectives? What have you been able to create? What do you want to brag about? And what could you have done differently if you could do it all over again? So that's what we're talking about. <laughs> and to kick it off, Paul, please give us an introduction of what you're doing, what's happening in Detroit, all the cool work that y'all are doing at Tech Town. What's happening? Well, thank you, Chelsea, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, San Antonio, for welcoming me from uh, warm Detroit. Um, <laughs> so I'll start by uh, making mention that I'm with Tech Town Detroit, which is um, it's fairly unique in its, in its business model and its history. It's um, a nonprofit organization that I like to call kind of um, three-legged stool it kind of sits on because it focuses on uh, place, space, and actual um, physical place, space, and tech. And so that three-legged stool um, is something that actually was born out of a vision from past president of a uh, urban research institution called Wayne State University. So our organization was co-founded by General Motors, which you've heard a little bit about, I think, and, and heard about automotive um, a bit, uh, Henry Ford Health Systems, and also Wayne State University. And so 20 years ago, um, incubation and acceleration obviously was not as glamorous and not as pervasive. Um, in ecosystems or in cities. Um, and so it was the vision of the then president to have kind of an eds and meds kind of play. He, um, from what I understand, I've only personally been at Tech Town for uh, five and a half years, but um, I've heard some of the, the stories of how things originated. And so it was to bring together um, educators and practitioners and researchers from Wayne State and, and connect them with uh, doctors and physicians and lab techs out of Henry Ford and a place out of their respective institutions to where they could collaborate and build great ideas um, in the city of Detroit. And fast forward many years, and granted, uh, we've come a long way. We've had our definite fair share of ups and downs and challenges. Um, but we focus on tech, obviously inherent in our name, which of the five to 600 businesses that we support each year, only about 125 of those will be tech. And so while I've always worked since my tenure at Tech Town, been in the tech space, I like to give a lot of kudos because there's some very hard and intense work that uh, leadership at Tech Town that precedes me was really bold enough to step into that really responded to the needs and the calls um, and the demands and the, and the requests of some of our uh, citizens across the city. And that was um, our place-based work, which we call blocks. And that place-based work supports your traditional business owners such as coffee shops, restaurants, small manufacturers in neighborhoods that are spread across the city of Detroit. Um, and so that's actually uh, three-fourths probably of the businesses that we support will not be tech businesses. There'll be these businesses in neighborhoods who also need marketing services, legal support, access to capital, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have physical space. So we're, um, we've grown from our, what I like to say, maybe our uh, original hub or physical center that houses actually about 175 businesses in a 135,000 square foot facility. And it's a mixed space of co-working, event space, and also longer-term tenant space. 
Um, we arranged and, and very fortunate to have a big brother in a large university. I know that we're very fortunate because that building and that facility was provided to us for a dollar, um, essentially, for the contractual purposes of it, but to really activate that space and make it a warm um, and inviting opportunity for entrepreneurs and business owners to get that support. So combining those three kind of trifecta elements is what really makes up TechTown Detroit. And I think the role that we play in the ecosystem is somewhat of hub and spoke, where we've been around the longest and we have great long you know, relationships that we've developed over time, but we really connect to a lot of other partners and collaborators and ecosystem builders and make sure that entrepreneurs get to the right place at the right time, irrespective of if it's our services or not. And we really try to stay genuine to that, to that thread and that mission. Yeah, that's Perfect, and I think sometimes when tech acts alone in isolation, it can't quite be maximized as well. So that's a really good example, a real world example of how you are spreading it out and inviting and being inclusive. Yeah, perfect. Joyce, I know if we go through all the things that you do on a daily basis, we will be here till May. So yeah, I'll try to <laughs> tell us it. just a few highlights of what I'll you're doing. I'll try to keep it short. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for, hello everybody, um, I'm Joyce Dooley. I'm a native San Antonian and I'm a founding member of the Geekdom community. Um, and it's been a real interesting treat over the last almost nine years to kind of watch the evolution of San Antonio and particularly our downtown urban core. And that co-working space that we talk about was actually created by Graham Weston and Nick Longo in a way to, as a way to increase, you know, technology talent within our city as well as to revitalize a dying urban core. And how do we attract new opportunities to San Antonio without sacrificing the talent that is here? And it's a really unique kind of journey that I've had with Geekdom because as a founding member, you know, I tripped into emerging technology consulting and research while I was there and through some of that additional work is how I ended up on staff at Geekdom at the end of 2017 to work with CivTech SA um, and the city's Office of Innovation and Geekdom's partnership program to connect students and startups and entrepreneurs with city departments to solve civic problems and to develop tech talent. Um, it's now in year three and has greatly expanded. That's awesome. um, and I've since moved to the internal innovation uh, programs basically like the pre-accelerator which is helping startup founders either prepare to scale their companies or to prepare for future investments um, and one of the most exciting things that we've been able to also build off of with the CivTech SA and the innovation that's coming out of Geekdom is the new incubator program and we're launching a civic technology pilot with the city of San Antonio for the next two years to try to develop some of these civic technology ideas and teams. Geekdom's mission really is to provide an opportunity and space for founders and ideas and for people who would not have normally considered themselves to be founders to have access to resources um, and support because starting a company is one of the most hardest things that you can do. I don't care if it's a nonprofit. I don't care if it's some giant enterprise that you want to eventually have. Startup life is hard and crazy. And so reaching out to people who are in the same place as you are is really important. And so we've really fostered this concept of being helpful and building communities. And so when the city of San Antonio's Kate Kinnison and our former director of programs, Dax Moreno, were talking about how we could tap into these resources that Geekdom has been activating for you know, such a long time, the city really needing to have assistance to be innovative and lean in a way that they can't do internally, this was a really great testing ground for the CivTech SA concept. And you know, we saw some really beautiful successes from that, and I think that we're gonna see a lot more. Agreed. It's been really fun to watch this evolution. Thank you. So, Krista, you know a thing or two about supporting entrepreneurs. <laughs> really excited about the work that you're doing at Velocity Texas. Tell us more about it. Thank you so much. And I'm really privileged to be able to call these um, people my friends. <laughs> so the work that we do is not done in silos. It's not done alone. So I'm really excited for all of the success and for the communities that we serve. So I brought some pictures. Um, so, again, I'm Krista Covey, I'm the Vice President of Economic Development for Velocity, and I oversee a lot of the innovation programs um, at the uh, innovation, innovation Hub. And I'm going to give you some context. So, Velocity was started by the Texas Research Technology Foundation, TRTF. It's a 35-year-old nonprofit foundation that was actually started by the former CEO of USAA, General McDermott. So, most of the San Antonio crowd here are very familiar with his name. 
And he strongly believed in economic development through entrepreneurship activities. And so he created the foundation which made seed stage investments in two companies, specifically in the bioscience and emerging technology spaces. So the foundation made those investments over the past 35 years. And we also had about 1,500 acres donated to the foundation where we have a research park out on the northwest side of San Antonio. So in 2016, Microsoft became very interested in a large portion of that property, and they bought it, which created a cash windfall for the foundation. And so the board really wanted to be, be good stewards of that money and continue the mission to support entrepreneurs and support San Antonio and South Central Texas. So they uh, purchased some additional acreage in the near east side of San Antonio. Uh, with the intention of developing an innovation hall, hub called Velocity. So let me. So it's not real pretty. This is the six acres here. Uh, it's off of Houston and Cherry Street. Um, and this is intentionally purchased in that area because it was an, um, a space in San Antonio that didn't see a whole lot of love over the years. And so there really need to be more redevelopment. And so we started off with seven buildings. We uh, went down to five. And um, this is what it looks, or this is one of the buildings here. This is a 100-year-old ice house. So it's kind of cool. It's got some, sorry, you guys can't see it, but you, you see it. Paul, you can come visit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> party at the ice house after. That's right, party kidding. at the ice house. <laughs> so this is uh, some of the renderings. And we actually finished our first phase and moved into our new innovation center last Monday. So woo woo. So we're pretty excited about that. <laughs> so it's the first phase and about a four phase project. Um, we're now working on the second building. Um, and we will construct the five to six story facility as well which will be office and lab space. Again, our focus is really on bioscience uh, because we saw that there, there was a lot of research and technology here in that space, but it wasn't being commercialized. And so we saw that as an opportunity to continue to build the momentum that was already here. Um, and then the Ice House will probably uh, turn into some boutique hotel. And so the idea behind this campus is really a live, work, play, or a place for innovation. So. We'll also have some event space and things like that. So the, there's another rendering there. Once we're finished, we'll be at about 330,000 square feet of space. And I brought this slide to show you sort of the bigger context. You know, we were pretty intentional, again, about being in that particular location in San Antonio, but it wasn't, wasn't without thought to the greater context of these other great placemakers here in San Antonio. Um, so university campuses, um, the Pearl District, places like that, Hemisphere, um, all great placemakers. So going back to the innovation, um, and Velocity is really a hub for um, science and technology in a bigger district for science and technology. But what actually happens on the innovation side is with the individuals, right? So the individuals that come through our doors are looking for help growing and starting, or starting and growing their businesses. And so as we're looking at the continuum of growth through the life cycle of a business, we're developing programs to support entrepreneurs at different stages. And that's why I am showing this slide right here. So we have different ways to serve different, um, uh, different types of, of companies uh, through ideation, acceleration, incubation, and then we also serve our uh, second or third stage growth companies as well. And so I won't go into all of that, but again, I just want to reiterate that it's the people and the environment that create the innovation. And that's the innovation piece to Innovation Hubs. Yeah, so we're noticing a couple of themes here, right? It's a handful of inspired, evolved people who say, we want to do this, and companies as well, not just individuals. And the power of place is super important. And I think that sometimes gets missed in a tech and an innovation conversation, but each of you talked about these physical places where people can come together. Are there any other key components or characteristics of innovation hubs that maybe we haven't mentioned so far? Paul, let's start with you. Um, well, I just want to kind of reemphasize that you had a key point, and I think that, that social capital. Yeah is just so vital. 
And I think what I've seen in just over five years and knowing about the history of TechTown a bit and even other ecosystem hubs is that obviously trust is paramount. Um, and, and the trust that we've been able to build in Detroit with TechTown Detroit has allowed us to kind of be this um, conduit slash honest broker slash convener role in the ecosystem, which um, has brought various different partners together and brought them to tables that they likely would not have been at um, otherwise. And, um, but we try to find those concentric circles and then hone in on those areas. And so my work over the last five years have kind of, I wish I could say I planned it, but it has been driven by that honest broker, that convener, and then being able to identify gaps in our ecosystem, but all based and driven by strengths and assets that are really relative to us and our ecosystem. And so I know a lot of cities and Detroit is um, no different that I remember hearing the theme and the conversation of, you know, um, we're gonna be the next Silicon Valley or we're gonna be the next Boston. And, and, and years ago, we kind of just turned that page and said, no, we're gonna be Detroit and we're gonna be responsive to our own identity and the needs of our own community. And I think that's what kind of evolved into this place-based entrepreneurial kind of response that now is spreading across to other cities across our state and even other states are coming to us and saying, okay, I'm not gonna be a, a, a maybe a pure tech hub. I'm gonna service tech clients if they're here and, and at the level that they're here, but we're not gonna be Silicon Valley, we're not gonna be Boston. And so um, in that same vein, I've done some work in water tech and FinTech and healthcare, which a lot of people wouldn't think of Michigan's being its largest economic producer being healthcare. Um, we think of Michigan as automotive, of course. And we heard from the previous panel about the importance of water. So looking at how is technology able to tap into um, water opportunities or water challenges around algal blooms and pollutants and infrastructure and using sensors. And then the other that I think is a, a natural fit that you probably could all appreciate is that we identify Detroit with being a mecca of music. Uh, because of Motown. So we now have built a, an accelerator and a program um, with Motown Museum, Motown Records, Universal. So I say all that to say that we really try to look at where our strengths and our assets are and then go deep into those areas and, and really being able and honest enough to say no and walk away from the things that don't make sense or where there aren't strengths and assets and where maybe there's someone else who can do that better we're completely comfortable with walking away from those things. So you're truly creating harmony in the community. Yeah, ecosystem harmonization, I like yeah, that. Yeah, I had to get a pun in there somewhere. I mean, come on. Good, that's good, I'm taking that. <laughs> Joyce, what other components or characteristics of innovation hubs haven't we covered so far that you want to emphasize? I mean, I feel like that's really hard because we've touched on so many great things. I think creating this space for people to come in and to have these experiences and to get to these resources and these thought leaders, as well as having the agency to tap into them independently is really key. When I was working on my uh, nonprofit before I took the role at Geekdom, I was traveling around Texas and talking to all of these really great engineers and developers and cities and you know, after these presentations, like I'd be talking to people and they would say, well, I have ideas, you know, I've got 25 years of experience. How do I get the city of Austin or the city of New Braunfels or, you know, Dallas to talk to me because I can help them do this better. And I said, well, unfortunately, there's only so many mechanisms for this to come into place. And so what San Antonio has done and not just with the CivTech SA project, but I think as a community is really tapped into these ecosystem partners who are working so diligently to provide these opportunities opportunities and really roll out the red carpet for our citizens, our residents, um, our entrepreneurs and students to have voices to come back into it. Yeah. Um, to kind of carry it further is that, you know, we don't do this alone. We've talked about ecosystems. And so even if there's density um, within a certain area, these things are actually happening simultaneously throughout you know, the city and its surrounding areas. And so I think that with all of this activation we've been doing for almost 10 years, we're really starting to see a real stride come in where not just, oh, are we making ground? Like, are we getting people's awareness up? But now that it is up and it's there and we have the mechanisms in place, we are actually able to start pushing people through these funnels into real activation and implementation, which is really exciting. That's a really great point because in, to me, from someone who doesn't live here but loves it here and visits as often as I can, it just seems that this is the way the town works. 
So very slowly, and it wasn't always this way, of course, but I think that's a real kind of ecosystem shift change is when it becomes just part of the way you do business. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think one of the things about San Antonio is that people forget that we're a really big city. You know, we are a major city, and my work has taken me very far outside of the state. And whenever I tell people what I do here, they go, really? That's happening in San Antonio? I didn't realize that even San Antonio had a downtown. <laughs> You're like, yeah. Oy. Oy. Okay, <laughs> great guys. Um, but so that, that community feel that we bring to the work that we do is really important, but... We're so strategically located. We have huge innovation hubs and centers, much like what Krista was talking about, and real talent here that either has gotten farmed out and is now finding a way home. And having that community and neighborly feel, I think, allows for that trust capital to come in and to allow us to go much further because we have that relationship in place. Great. Krista, anything you want to add in terms of characteristics or? Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, the, the collaboration, um, especially with San Antonio, has resonated throughout the conversation here today. But, um, you know, I came to San Antonio three years ago to, you know, as the founding team for, for Velocity. And it, I just want to echo what you said. It's so true. It's, we're almost self-deprecating in one way because it's like, oh, well, we're just kind of the little city. But I'm like, no, you're like a big little city. <laughs> and so, and, but it's great that everybody works together. And so it's, um, again, it's just visibility for innovation, for solving real world problems and creating programs around that, like hackathons and um, different, you know, events and things like that, highlighting and being, you know, highlighting the problems, making people aware of problems, but then the community sort of gathers around to solve those problems. And so our job is really to say, okay, we've got some you know, excitement around how we can solve these problems. What's our role? So how do we continue to push the ball forward? And I think that's where uh, we can make significant change in all of our communities across the US. Yeah. So I'm a big um, proponent of telling stories, and I think specifically for communities who are trying to get to what you have already created, telling the story about the big brags is important. So it's bragging time, it's Texas. What's one thing that you're super proud of, and we'll start with you, Krista, and then come back down. I'm, I'm, so I am super proud of the collaboration that's happened um, within the city. Um, we have this group called the ESO uh, Lunch, and that's all the entrepreneur support organizations in San Antonio that get together, and we talk about challenges and opportunities together. I think that's a big win. Um, I don't. You mean you don't compete with each other for who gets co entrepreneur? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the buzzword of the day. Co that's right. And so I have um, fellow um, ESO, yeah, cooperators. <laughs> here. It's great. So, and, and Paul, you mentioned it before. So if we've got an entrepreneur that comes into our space and it's like, you know what, they're not bio or, or life science or something like that. Uh, maybe they're do something, doing something cool in, you know, developing an app or something like that. I'm like, go check out Geekdom. It's amazing. They've got all sorts of resources, right? But we have that, uh, it, it, it's, it's shared goodness, right? So if it's good for Geekdom, it's good for us. If it's good for us, that's good for the community, right? So I'd, I'd say that is a win. Yeah. Um, and we've got, we've got to do a better job, I think in San Antonio specifically, of telling the stories of innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, Graham Weston obviously um, is, is a great story, um, a legacy here locally, and we need more, um, we need more Rackspace stories, yeah. right? Yeah. So, sure. Joyce, a big win, brag time. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, so I'm really fortunate because working in the Geekdom co-working space and being a program manager and dealing with our members, which I know there are several here in the crowd tonight, um, but I will call out um, Go Smart Solar in particular because they kind of touch a couple of different things. So Go Smart Solar has been working for many, many years doing an innovation and technology stuff and have worked on sustainability efforts and solar initiatives and had a major win with their Big Sun Community Solar Program that they launched last year with CPS Energy. Um, and just because life is funny and interesting, um, 
and the collision that happens at Geekdom, one of their rock star team members is Andre Gomez. Mm. And not because he participated in the CivTech SA program in year one, like his cohorts did, but he actually was introduced to one of our teams from year one CivTech SA um, because they want to do a point-to-point -point navigation solution for the Riverwalk. And I had heard that Andre had a background in IoT, Internet of Things, and connected devices, and that he was a prodigy. And so I got Andre connected to Matt Monroe and Colby Doyle, and they've been collaborating for over a year now, and all three of them signed into our new incubator program that officially launches in March. And so that proximity that is there, that local talent that is there, although Andre is not local, he came from the Venture for America Fellowship Program, um, and he's made a life here in San Antonio and is making a community impact, you know, even from being elsewhere. And so you don't have to be of us to be with us, and I think that that's really huge. huge. Um, but there's too many to count. Um, I have another brag that I thought about. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Paul, so we'll get to you. I'm sorry. Worry. Sorry. I have to. <laughs> so I have to tell a story about sports sonar. It's like a family so. conversation here. Like, I feel I like I'm in the den. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Sports Sonar was one of our uh, companies that went through our Global Accelerator uh, program. So it was actually two different uh, companies that came from Costa Rica. They came here through our accelerator. They joined forces to create Sports Sonar. So they are, they are able to uh, send out videos and information via ultrasonic tones that you can't hear to anyone's cell phones or other devices without the use of Bluetooth or internet. So pretty cool, right? Well, they pivoted recently because unfortunately there's gun violence um, in schools, but they're able to, they created SafeWave, which is, um, a, they're using the same technology to deliver alerts throughout the schools where they can have a quicker response time than what's already out there now. So it's huge. And they have just grown exponentially. So they went through our accelerator program, graduated, went through our incubator program, and on, on Friday, we're actually celebrating their growth from, and, and graduation from our Velocity Incubator program. They're getting their own space, they're hiring people, um, and ultimately they're saving lives. So it's a really cool success story for, yeah. for innovation. Way to go. Okay. I do have one quick thing. If you want to know quick, actually what's Paul's happening. Get super from, upset no, me. no, no. <laughs> this is not about any particular company, but if you want to know more about what's happening from innovation and startup and entrepreneurial perspective, please read Iris Gonzalez's publication, Startup San Antonio. She is doing all of that. Just go to startupsanantonio.com. You'll be able to check it all out and get all this information and more. Yeah, no problem. You get I enjoyed two that. big brags. <laughs> I could have sat here easily for another 20, 30 minutes and listened to the great success stories. But I think mine, uh, my kind of last closing remarks in, the, in this vein will be less around maybe a specific moment um, that happened and, and one that's more around kind of this ecosystem harmonization. So, of course, it's, it's no um, you know secret some of the challenges that Detroit has been through. But... Um, in Detroit and, and the fact of where we sit geographically is there's a kind of an undervalued asset and, and geographic kind of value in the fact that we're right at a um, you know international border. And so Windsor is probably 15 minutes away from where I sit at Tech Town. And we've really been able to, uh, no pun intended, kind of create real true relationship driven bridges with Ontario and Windsor to really strengthen both sides of the border and both of our entrepreneurial ecosystems. And once again, that was looking at potential strengths and potential assets that are unique to our ecosystem and really honing in on those. Um, and so that's, that's kind of really worked wonders for us, but I would also say kind of in the broader context is that um, Detroit and Tactown have really built a, a, a strong level of resilience. And a strong level of resilience meaning obviously we went through municipal bankruptcy, we had the automotive recessions, we had the housing collapses, we had you know, eight more collapses if you could figure them out. Um, and, but at the same time, I think our community, our private sector, public sector, and philanthropy was huge at a time when private sector couldn't step in to provide funding and sustainability of some of the entrepreneurial service organizations in our region. Philanthropy stepped up huge. I mean, one organization, New Economy Initiative, poured in over the course of eight years north of $120 million into entrepreneurial ecosystems with 80% of that 
going into um, Detroit proper and another 20% in surrounding cities and counties. And all of our work really, I think, has been done at TechTown being an on-ramp and a place where people could feel that they were welcome, where there's accessibility, where you could come in and be wrong and be vulnerable and fail. Um, we've really led with that, and I think that that has really translated across the ecosystem. And I think that that's just critically important because um, we've built great relationships, but we've also built great trust around our ecosystem, and it's all been led with that diversity and inclusion lens. So um, one thing that I'll kind of leave you with, it, and, and this is, you know, we, I think entrepreneurial folks, if any of you are in the room or all of those who are, we often talk about the diversity and inclusiveness of startups and entrepreneurs, and we need to get more women and people of color funding and dollars. Um, I would also, if you haven't already, or if you know of other programs, I would love to talk to you but to also consider about changing the dynamics of um, you know, buy side kind of diversity, meaning the people who actually write checks, the people who are investor analysts, the people who are gonna actually run funds, the people who are gonna be angel investors potentially, to train or provide mechanisms and doors and mentorship so that we can also change the dynamics of that side of the equation because it's equally, if not more important, um, than the other side as well. Yeah, and you all have provided such a great example that it's not only the right thing to do, it can also produce returns, not just for the whole community, but for individuals on all sides of the funding conversation. Women startups outperform men startups every day of the week, right? <laughs> That's what I read. <laughs> this is an inclusive power panel. Everyone, welcome. Okay, so if you had to do it all over again, what is one of the things you would do differently? Another way to pose that question is what lessons can you share with others in the audience who may be wanting to do similar things to what you all have done? Paul, we'll let you go all first. All right, I'll go right? first because <laughs> yeah, I want to listen to you guys. So yeah. I'll be quick. So two quick things. One is um, things that I would have done different. Um, I, I, I reflect back a little bit to some of this cluster-based sector-focused kind of economic and, uh, development and entrepreneurial work that I've been uh, privy to be a part of. And uh, one thing that I, I reflect back and say is, man, I wish I would have really captured the small wins, the medium-sized wins, the testimonials, the success stories from day one as, as with the anticipation that whatever program this is or whatever, whatever service delivery model or new idea, that this is gonna be big. And years from now, for example, for TechTown as an entity, we didn't start tracking metrics until 2007 and we were founded in 2000. So I guess one day, you know, leadership said, man, maybe we're going to be around for a little while to come. So we should start tracking this stuff because we're going to have to go out and get money. So that's, that's one thing that actually comes to mind is actually collecting those success stories. And then another thing that I think about in some of the work that I've done within the healthcare uh, sector with payers, providers, entrepreneurs, investors, and building kind of a health tech or med tech focused uh, cluster in southeastern Michigan and southwestern Ontario, and that is um, the development of relationships. We obviously know, all know, how important and how imperative and how critical relationships are. I mean, partnerships are not driven, in my opinion, by business entities. They're driven by the people that are obviously within those organizations. So having that mindset has kept me going to, even if I got to no, know, I go to the next person. Get a no, get a no. I'm going to find that right person who is, likes this idea and is willing, and, and now you've got the partnership of the organization when you find that right champion. Um, but at the same time, I think building vertical and horizontal relationships within institutions, one thing that I fell into a, a short trap, I learned quickly, but I fell into the short trap of I find someone, we sync, you know, they're, they're, they buy in, they're really on board for a program or a collaborative effort, and then I go to the next organization and I wouldn't necessarily circle back to really strategically and intentionally build relationships vertically and or horizontally because I ran into the instance that, you know, Zane or uh, Philip or whomever departs that organization and then kapoof, you know, the relationship is difficult, very difficult to re kind of build that and to retransfer that the passion, 
the buy-in and all of the, you know, um, kind of, you know, trust that you've built in that previous relationship. So those are the two things that I think come to mind for me. Wise words. Joyce, what would you do differently if you were starting at day one? Well, before I do that, I have to say, Paul, I know that you've been doing a lot of work with Tech Town and that Detroit has seen quite a transformation over the last few years. And our CEO, Charles Wooden, is actually from a town in Michigan just outside of Detroit. And he went and visited sometime end of last year and was blown away by the progress that you guys have been doing. So you do have support down here in San Antonio awesome. for all your efforts. You know, if you want to find a new relationship to build, we can talk about that. Absolutely. Um, sister, we'll cities. <laughs> sister cities. Sister cities. Um, <laughs> but some of the things that I think that it's really difficult for people to deal with when there's so many voices talking all at once is really finding out what motivates, you know, the different partners and the different communities. Um, you know, everybody has a, things that they need to accomplish and to get done. And so kind of finding a way to better stand in the middle and listen to, you know, the feedback that's coming as well as just figuring out how to be a good partner, not just look for good partners. And when you're dealing with programs like what we deal with at Geekdom, where we were talking about students, entrepreneurs, a lot of them are military um, and veteran members, um, as well as students and all the other things, like those are people in points of transition. You know, so Geekdom serves kind of as a Sherpa and a support system, but also as a shield for any sort of partnerships that come through. And the same thing goes, like we shield our other partners with the people who come through it. And so finding translators or people who can sit in the middle is really crucial. And we don't always do it as well as we'd like, but we'd like to get better um, and better. I would say it's a problem for people who build hyper locally to kind of break through the bubble or the barrier to get to the people who are outside that can help leverage resources internally. Mm -hmm. And so having to build hyper locally here at Geekdom and then the San Antonio initiatives that we have going on are they're fantastic. But when we go elsewhere, people aren't necessarily aware of what we are doing and how impactful it could be, and they're not even sure how to get involved. And so we need to find ways to, to do that story sharing outside of you know industry news, but also to build those additional relationships. And I think that that's something that we're gonna be working on in 2020. Excellent. Yeah. Krista, bring it home. Okay, <laughs> so just to echo, I think what, what you both um, said was excellent, um, developing the relationships. Um, uh, horizontally and vertically is really important and also um, what I think we should have or what what would have been um, we could have always done more of is just been more out uh, boots on the ground talking to the community and saying look here's what we're doing we tried to do some of that but it's like what how can what are your problems what are your uh, um, issues um, and what are the barriers that prevent you from success right so um, in the area that we're located at um, we've got some a wonderful community but some might have transportation problems right so um, as we're building this innovation hub it's like great we have all these great resources and assets and things like that but if the people can't get to your innovation hub that's a problem that's a barrier right so um, it's not that we're not thinking about that but I wish we had thought about that a little bit earlier um, and there's um, and, and via, and there's some resources now that are, are kind of, um, you know, helping us with, with those issues. Um, and then, of course, you know, building, um, building relationships um, with stakeholders is a continual thing. Um, when we first um, approached our universities, right, which are great partners, they're the ones that have um, the researchers, the clinicians, um, all this expertise, they're building great things. A lot of the, um, a lot of that is happening um, farther away from our <laughs> our center, right? But there are stakeholders and there are partners. So again, it goes back to transportation. Um, so that's something that's very personal to us. Um, and then I'd say, you know, um, the the buildings um, were historic, and so I shoulda, woulda, coulda. It's a very expensive process um, to redevelop historic sites. 
Um, so that's something um, that we've we've managed and we've been blessed by the foundation. Um, and I think the end product is really exciting. It's something that San Antonio has needed for a long time. And we're continuing to be innovative to make sure that we're serving our community in the best way possible. And again, it's not just us serving our community. Um, solving It's our community that's actually solving the problems, working with friends, working with partners um, that are also doing the same work and building our entrepreneurial ecosystem that's so important. So I can't say enough about the collaboration that's happened and that will continue to happen. So I think, again, that's the most important thing. Um, but shoulda, woulda, coulda, hindsight, I, I wish we had taken a little bit more time um, solving, spending more time on some of the barriers for um, other people's success. Yeah, I think that comment is um, so spot on because Krista, I think in, as practitioners, it's so easy for us to lose sight of what we teach every day and not um, practice that in our own kind of elements in our day-to-day -day work. So we always talk about customer discovery, you know, should never stop and user-centered design should never stop. And so if we, it's hard, you know, it's difficult to stay conscious of that in our own work, but it's something that um, you know better, you do better, right? <laughs> we know better, we'll do better. Yes, Paul. Yeah. So some common themes, it's all about people at the end of the day. Absolutely. Place is super, super important. Um, Persistence, I heard a lot about persistence and not giving up. Um, any other P's that I left out? Any audience? Passion, passion. oh, that's a good one. High five. Patience, Chris Castro, yes. Perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah. And gratitude, that doesn't start with the P, it starts with the G, but thank you. I mean, to everyone thank who's you. here who's been fortunate enough to witness this and listen to these leaders, champion them hero make them, tell the stories. They all want boots on the ground to be able to listen more and get the word out, help them do that. That is your homework. And thank you so much for thank sharing you. all of your work. We're grateful for it. Thanks.